Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, throughout Lent, we've been looking at the book of Zechariah in connection to the passion of our Lord. And today we're looking at chapters, selections from chapter 7 and 8. Now, this section of Zechariah is not nearly as attention-grabbing as Zechariah's four horsemen or the epic battle marches or the confrontation in the heavenly courtroom, which you could always catch up on if you want through our YouTube channel. However, it does contain the core of Zechariah's message to the returning exiles into Jerusalem. Uh, following the exile, it really became crystal clear to the Jews that Yahweh was very angry with them. And now they had grown so used to God's provision and protection, but now they were driven off into Babylon. They certainly did not enjoy it, and they wanted to get back in, well, God's good graces. Now, they had several solutions, and, and one of their own solutions that they came up with was to hold some self-imposed fasts and days of mourning every year. They were on some of the different important days, like the day when Jerusalem uh, was captured and besieged. Now, if you've ever gotten into serious trouble, I'm sure none of, none of you have, but if you've ever gotten into serious trouble with someone you live with, could be um, a family member, uh, or maybe you, in order to try to get back on their good side, perhaps you try to look maybe a little bit more pathetic than normal or sad in hopes that they'll take pity on you. And that's kind of what the surviving Jews were, were aiming for, but Yahweh was really having none of it. He wanted his people to make real changes, and not just surface or showy changes. He said, I didn't tell you to do that. That's not the changes I want you to make. Make the changes I have called for instead of substituting in your own changes. In our reading, he said, this is what I want. Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourn, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. Well, this is nothing, really nothing new. What God wants for his people is to act, well, let's say, less like Joseph's brothers who sold Joseph into slavery, and more like Joseph who saved his brothers and forgave them. It's the same kind of advice that Moses gave the Israelites in Deuteronomy, a book where he's kind of breaking down for the Israelites what God wants from them and what they were signing up for when they signed this new covenant and contract with them. And it's the constant refrain of the prophets, both minor and major. Yahweh says, you want to know why you got punished? It's simple, because your, father, your forefathers were unfaithful, cruel, and unfair, and that's why I sent them into exile. However, then later in the reading, he says, yet I, I still ache for my people's plight. I've punished them, but I don't enjoy it. In fact, I promise that I will have pity on them, and I will restore them. He promises to restore Jerusalem, and he uses evocative language to describe it, because at this point, it's helpful to, to know, Jerusalem right now, at this point, is really a small, underpopulated city of mostly returning exiles. It's not that far from a ghetto at this point. Now, I remember in college, I went on a mission trip with a Christian group into to Detroit, into, and there was all kinds of, the section we went to, there were all kinds of abandoned buildings, and we got to learn and, and see all the, the kinds of uh, problems and sometimes even tragedies that could, were more likely to arise in situations like that. Well, Jerusalem was a lot like that, an abandoned city that needed more people to live in it. And it was the kind of place you probably didn't want to go to if you didn't have to. And yet, to this city, Yahweh makes great promises. He says that it will be basically paradise on earth. People won't have to look over their shoulders or watch their neighbors with suspicion. They will relax, basically, in their rocking chairs and shoot the breeze with their neighbors. 
boys and girls will play in the streets, and they won't have to worry about uh, kidnappers or, or anything else. It will be a full, bustling, prosperous, and safe city. Regularly ranking number one in the Middle East for favorite cities to live in or visit. Uh, but what's more, Yahweh promises that it's going to be the reversal of the exile. Instead of everyone being forcibly carried away from Jerusalem, people will voluntarily and happily return to Jerusalem from all the ends of the earth. I will bring my exiles back. And most important of all, Yahweh says, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. This is, to those people, was certainly a, a, a wonderful promise of, of how God was going to restore them. And um, it's a kind of picture that really anyone can appreciate. It's the kind of place we'd all like to live. And it's exactly the kind of thing God's people were hoping for and anticipating when Jesus arrived. It's what the disciples, it looks like from what we can see, it's what the disciples were kind of hoping for or anticipating. Well, if you're wondering what this, yes, this does have something to do uh, with Jesus eating the Passover, being betrayed, and making a new covenant in his blood. Jesus has come to Jerusalem. Unfortunately, Jerusalem is not ready for him. The leaders are doing the same kinds of things Zechariah had said not to do, like uh, oppressing the poor and the widow, which Jesus calls the, the leaders on the carpet for. They are currently, in fact, these leaders of Jerusalem, plotting out Jesus' demise, waiting for Judas to hand him over to them in just a few hours, which is exactly what Zechariah said, do not plot evil against your brother. When it becomes clear later that Jesus is not going to fight back as he goes on trial, the city and the crowd abandon or despise Jesus. They reject repentance and reconciliation and prefer rebellion. Jesus' message certainly has not changed. Unfortunately, at this point, neither had the heart of God's people. Humanity was not ready for Jesus. So, too, you and me are sometimes not ready for our Lord to return. They, the people in, Zach, uh, in Jesus' day had certainly not returned with all their hearts, as Zechariah had implored them to do. They were stuck on outward shows of piety, but their hearts were still diamond hard. However, the good news is that Jesus knew all this. And Jesus has not come to continue the familiar Old Testament rhythm of punishing God's people until they return to him and then having to do it all over again. No, Jesus is giving them something new, a new covenant. Well, what is it that makes this covenant new? Well, this new covenant is not, is not um, sealed by the blood of animals. It is not made real by, what, uh, by sacrifices. Rather, this new covenant is in our Savior's blood. This new covenant will be best expressed in Jesus' willingly shed blood to make his people one and to make them new in heart and mind. The, the blood of, of animals, of bulls and goats was acceptable, was accepted, I, could, I should say, was accepted as a sign of God's reconciliation in the Old Testament. But the blood itself really couldn't do anything. But the blood of the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, well, the blood of Christ, that blood washes away our sins. And this is the new covenant in Jesus' blood, a new covenant that does not depend upon our goodness or efforts or upon the goodness of our own hearts but upon the power and the compassion of the triune God, upon the power of the Holy Spirit to transform and change even dead hearts like ours. A new covenant, a covenant of a new heart. A new covenant revealing also God's heart, a heart of compassion. Some things have, have not changed. 
What God wants for his people, for and from his people now, is basically the same thing he wanted for and from his people in Zechariah's day. He wanted them not to oppress the fatherless or the widow or to plot against each other. And he wants us to look out for those who are on rough straits and not to plot against one another either. He wanted them to be fair, but also generous. And that's how God wants you and me to interact with one another. Sometimes we still need our hearts softened. Sometimes we maybe even are guilty of putting too much emphasis upon our own traditions, which, is, which can, are good when they point us to Christ, but not if we substitute them for what our Lord requires of us. Sometimes in our own lives, sin still rears its ugly head, and, and that's why we're constantly repenting and praying for God's mercy and for his Holy Spirit to change us and to change our hearts. However, we give thanks for what is new. The gift of the Holy Spirit, these new hearts given to us by Christ and complete and, uh, and total justification through Christ's sacrifice, that is something new and good. The way in which we now receive forgiveness is not through bulls or goats, but through the shed blood of Christ. And that God is a forgiving and merciful God that's completely consistent with the Old Testament, despite what you may have heard. But the magnitude and the depth of forgiveness are certainly much more fully revealed in Christ crucified. And by, and by giving us this meal even today, Jesus makes clear who this new covenant is for, who this meal is for. We simply listen to the words of our Lord. It is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. In Jesus' name, amen.